a surgical uh, shoulder, elbow, wrist and, and hand up in York. Uh, for those of you who have never been to York, it's one of the most magnificent places in the UK and at the very least well worth a visit to come and have a look around. It's quite extraordinary. Um, I really want to thank you for joining me on this uh, very, very warm summer's evening. Um, this talk is basically about problems playing tennis and golf. Um, but at the end with the q and I'm happy to answer any questions on any problems in your arm whatsoever. Um, so I promise on this hot evening not to keep it too long, hopefully to keep it entertaining and relevant. Uh, and hopefully you'll have a glass of something cold with you just to keep you, uh, keep you nice and hydrated. Um, it's a very timely uh, moment to talk about golf and tennis uh, injuries. We've um, just had a great Wimbledon, uh, the Open's on its way, and um, we're right in the middle of the seasons. So I'm guessing a lot of you may have had some problems and perhaps that's why you're here. Um, I'm going to take a bit of a risk today because normally when you get a doctor talking to you, we are people who tend to hide behind PowerPoint it's a bit too late for that, so um, bear with me. I'm going to promise you one thing for sure, which is no PowerPoint slides. You're going to have the, the pleasure of hearing me talk for about 20 minutes or so, um, just with some props. And I will, at some point, be asking you to join me to do some things. Now, I can't see you, so I'll leave you that. <laughs> That's your discretion, but there is some audience participation if you want it. Um, we are going to go through the commonest problems that you're likely to get, an element also, more importantly, of how to how to prevent them. And also some of the things that, frankly, we can sometimes miss as medics and how to avoid that and how to think about your injuries so that we can think about all the things that's caused it. Um, so I'm gonna start first of all with what brings you to your doctor. And most of the time for us, it, it, it's pain in a limb or a joint. Um, that's obviously not so surprising, but it can be stiffness, it can be clicking, um, you know, for those people who um, have problems with your legs, it can obviously be problems walking and running, um, but pain is the main thing. Most of the times the problems that I see are sort of insidious, they start gently and then they build up over time and they cause a problem, but every now and then they can be sudden, an injury or a sudden tearing otherwise. If it's sudden, it's probably better to see one of us sooner rather than later, because occasionally things can be torn that need uh, to be repaired again. Most of the time not, but occasionally can. So the first thing I'll say is if it's sudden, that's probably a good moment to come and see us. Um, the thing that I really want to say second of all is, is, is not medical. Um, what's the underlying cause here? Why has this happened? Now, sometimes it can be because you're like me, <laughs> turning 50, and all the things I've been treating for the last 20 years, I haven't, I'm firmly into my middle age and I'm starting to get myself. So um, it may just be that. Um, but it may be an underlying problem with how you're gripping that tennis racket, your stance in golf, your backs, your legs, all those sorts of things. So I, I will always bring up whether it's worth seeing a pro, having a lesson and getting them to look at that because it's no good for you if I make your shoulder better, for example, and then you carry on doing the thing that's making it worse in, in the first place. So it's always worth, at the very least, in these days, you know, I'm old enough to have grown up in the time of video recorders with great big things with a, with a separate VCR thing. We've all got phones now, get someone to record you and at least you can look at it yourself. And that, that's quite useful. Um, the other thing in terms of all of that is that um, I don't claim to be the world's greatest golfer or tennis player by any chance, but particularly for me in tennis, I found that as I was starting to feel I was getting places, I was just doing things too hard and pushing like mad at a time when you should be more smooth. And that extra muscle tension can, can sometimes be, be a problem. So point number one is if it's acute or sudden, consider coming to see one of us sooner rather than later. Point number two is get someone to video you at the very least, um, but go and see a pro if you think you may have an underlying problem. Let's go on to the third thing. And this sounds so obvious, um, but I think a lot of us are guilty of forgetting this when you go and see a doctor. And that is we need to look at the whole body. Now, the guru here for me is a guy called Ben Kibler, K-I-B-L-E-R. We stand on the shoulders of giants, and I need to pay tribute to the people who have really pushed this field forward. And I, I saw Ben give the most extraordinary conference about 10 years ago in Manchester. 
a whole weekend on the shoulder blade, believe it or not, full of physios and only me and one other surgeon there. And he's the guy who looks after a lot of the sort of world's most famous tennis players and works with those agencies. And he often says that the problems can be caused somewhere completely remote. Uh, and he describes, for example, elbow or shoulder pain as being the victim. Um, whereas the cause is elsewhere. So what's an example of this? Uh, the things that he does, and you can do this yourself now, um, uh, it, first of all, is to look at things like your core stability. And this applies to golf and tennis. What is your core stability? Your core is the middle of you. I'm probably preaching to the converted here. It's your trunk, it's your pelvis, it's the muscles that keep those strong and keep your balance. And a good way to test your core stability, sorry for the noise of scraping my chair, is to stand on one leg and see how wobbly you are. And um, if you're gonna do this at home, uh, make sure you don't fall over. Um, but it's a really good test to stand straight on one leg and see how balanced you are. Um, I uh, started doing things like yoga and Pilates uh, when I <laughs> went to a birthday party for my daughter who was five and the mum uh, was giving a yoga class for the children and invited the grown-ups to join in and I found that I couldn't sit cross-legged unless I had a wall behind me at which point I realized I needed to become more flexible and I needed to get, a, get better core stability. So that's the first thing that needs to be worked on to prevent injuries and to stop arm problems particularly. Um, the second thing that he looks at um, and this to me was a real education, is to look at things like hip power. Now, why look at hip power? Well, there is evidence out there to suggest some people with tennis elbow, it does seem to arise from problems in the hips being weak. And the thing that he does, and I appreciate you can't see this, but you stand not just on one leg, but you then bend the knee until it's bent greater than about 45 degrees, at which point your hip muscles start kicking in. And if you're very wobbly, that's something that needs to be looked at. And your doctor should have a look at your hips and make sure your rotation's okay, they're not too tight. Your physio will probably do this because your physio is the person who's really trained in all this sort of stuff. Um, but your doctor should do this as well. Um, the other important thing is to look at the shoulder blade because the ball and socket of your shoulder the socket is actually part of the shoulder blade, and I'll show you a little model of that. When you do this, two thirds of the movement is the ball and the socket moving, but one third of the movement is the actual shoulder blade moving, the whole shebang. How does the shoulder blade move? Well, it's got a huge numbers of muscles attached to it, all of which have to either fire or relax in perfect synchrony. And any injury or any pain stops that working so well. And that can make things not right, fire wrong. From our point of view, what we do is really easily. We just, we just um, take a top off, look at you from behind and have a look at your shoulder blade, how it sits and how it moves as you move it around and that's the starting point and look for asymmetry. Asymmetry is a strange old thing. We're all by and large right or left-handed. I'm an odd one. I write and operate with my left hand. I do everything else with my right. I'm a bit ambidextrous, but I'm a bit strange in that respect. Um, I have a bit of an interest in treating professional musicians. I've just come back from an amazing conference in Chicago where they were measuring muscle activities and drummers. And these are people whose arms look exactly the same, but when, and they, and they look the same when we saw them work, but when you look at the muscle activity, there were totally different muscles working on the right side and the left. So all of this looking at the whole body stuff, core stability, how are your hips? How are you walking? How's your strength in your legs? How's your back? All need, and how's your shoulder blade moving? All needs to be looked at because yes, if you come with elbow pain, the chances are there's a problem in the elbow that we need to sort out for you, but is there something else that's gonna make it keep coming back? And we better get on top of that as well. So let's move on then to the final part of this, which is hypermobility. Hypermobility or hyperlaxity or double jointedness is a little bit of a personal bugbear of mine because I would see people who had seen doctor after doctor after doctor with joint injury after joint injury after joint injury. 
And it's only putting that all together that you realize they're double jointed. And perhaps that's the reason why these problems have occurred. What does that mean? What it means is the collagen threads that run within me, um, are, mine are made of denim. Um, despite the yoga and the Pilates, I struggle to touch my toes. There are other people who can stick their foot behind their head and do the splits. Um, in many senses, for most of us, it's not a disease. It's like being short or tall, you know, um, it's just a characteristic. But the problem for some people is it can be an issue. If you're so hypermobile, you can force your joints repeatedly into the wrong position, and then you can get injuries. And maybe that's not a problem in daily life, but when you're forever serving or swimming in front crawl, for example, is another classic one, that can cause problems. Um, what you'll be glad to know is that the majority of the treatment for that is physiotherapy based. It is treating, uh, the, it, it is training the body to recognize how joints are centered and to activate the muscles to make sure that they don't come out. You can put tape on to give position sense. Another example of this from the performing arts world is that um, young kids who are amazing at ballet are often hyper lax, but they aren't often the ones that make it to be professional because they can push their joints into positions that aren't so good. They're stars, they can do the things others can't but they get injuries and the collagen in hyperlax people doesn't tend to heal quite so well. So how do you know if you've got hyperlaxity that could be contributing? There's a score called the Baton score, B-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. It's a bit of a blunt tool, but you can do it on yourself. This is the second bit of uh, audience participation. Um, so it's out of nine. If you can get your own thumb and make it reach, how do I do this? Make it reach your forearm. As you see, I can't get the thumb to touch the forearm. That's one. On the other side, on both sides, that's two. If I can bring my little finger back so that this angle here is right back to 90 degrees, three and four, as you can see, I can do neither. If I can, if I extend my elbow, you see it goes straight. In some people, it over straighten sometimes over 30 degrees that's five and six if it opens over straighten so touching one two 90 degrees three four over straightens on this one five over straightens on this one six then if you stand up and straighten your knee i'm not flexible enough to straighten my knee but if i did if i if with if when i'm standing up and i make my knees as straight as i can possibly go if they over bend on one leg, that's seven. On the other leg, that's eight. And finally, if I stand straight and reach down and I can not just touch my toes, but with my legs straight, get my hands flat on the floor, that's nine. The way that I remember this when I'm teaching my uh, trainees, I call it the base of Macarena. No, 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 Macarena. Oh, my apologies for the song and the singing, but there we go. Um, if you have some say four, some say five, there are definitions to this out of nine, then you are hyperlax. You're not necessarily um, uh, got a disease with it, but you are more stretchy than most. And that's something that has to be factored into the physiotherapy and the treatment to make the whole of you okay. So if you notice, I've been talking for about 10 minutes and I have not yet come onto a body part. We're gonna do that now. So to summarize, if it's sudden, see a doctor. If you think there's a problem with how you play, go see a pro. And then when you do see a doctor, make sure they look at the whole of your body, not just the bit that is painful because that may be the culprit or it may just be the bit itself that's the culprit. We're gonna talk now briefly about the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist and the commonest problems uh, that, that occur in those. Now, there's only about four or five that I'm, I'm gonna bring up. But at the end of this, I'm happy to talk about any of them. Um, in the shoulder, the commonest problem that we're likely to see is a rotator cuff injury or bursitis. Uh, in tennis, it's usually in your dominant serving arm. And in golf, it's usually in your non-dominant leading shoulder. So if I'm right-handed and I swing, it's often in the left. It can be in either. What does that mean? Let's have a think about the shoulder. Um, I'm going to bang on now about the glory of anatomy in, in the arm. It, it's, quite, it's quite something when you get to learn about it and think about it. Um, think of a skeleton of a hip. If I had one next to me, you'd have a ball, 
you'll have a socket. And that ball is surrounded by that socket. It's right around it. And there's a reason for that. The first thing is when you're walking on a leg, you don't really want a dislocation. But the second thing is that that's great at preventing dislocations. And that's okay to surround it, to prevent it, because all your legs got to do really is this and that. So that's okay. Your shoulder is similarly the joint where a limb joins the body, the upper limb, not the lower limb. But your shoulder is a different deal because to state the very obvious, your hip ain't got to do that and your shoulder does. So how does a shoulder look different to a hip? Bearing in mind, you know, they've got similar origins. And the answer is when you look at an X-ray or a skeleton of a shoulder, you will see the ball in the socket, but the socket being part of the shoulder blade here, the socket is smaller than the ball. So it's not constrained. It can do all of that. Well, that's fantastic, but there is a downside. There is a reason why you don't know anyone who's dislocated their hip, but you know a whole heap of people have dislocated their shoulder. It is prone to instability. So what holds it together? And yes, the lining of the joint grips it, and that's got some ligaments in it, but also the rotator cuff muscles. There are four muscles that come from the shoulder blade that surround the ball and socket. And they don't just move the ball and socket, they clamp it together and stop it moving around so much. I'm hoping you'll be able to see this okay. This is a model of a shoulder. I'm gonna take the ball out. You can see the ball here. And it, you can see the muscles all around the shoulder blade here that go around it. And if I look inside here, just like a little Easter egg, you can see this socket in there. Now, the hip guys have got an advantage over us because when they do a hip replacement, that's a big thing to put a cup into. I did a shoulder replacement this morning and I ain't got a lot of bone to get that into there, but it's fine, you can and you do. So um, you can see how these muscles hold the ball and socket together and clamp it together. You've got the collarbone above here. I'm going to attempt to do this without PowerPoint, bear with me. Ball socket. This is the top muscle of the rotator cuff muscles called supraspinatus. That's the one that often tears. If that's my supraspinatus there, and I've got a collarbone above here, every time I do this, I'm actually squishing that tendon. Now, that is why you get so many problems overhead. So what helps us? Well, between the tendon and the bone is something called a bursa. A bursa, is, you get these anywhere you get rubbing. So if you imagine the ball in the socket of the joint, which is made of this lining, which makes a lubricating fluid, that's the same stuff. Think of a bursa like a balloon that's been filled with water and then almost all the water is let out and you've got a little thin film in there. And so any time you get too much squishing of that, it gets angry. Itis is inflammation. Appendicitis is an angry inflamed appendix. And bursitis is an angry inflamed bursa. And where you feel it is on overhead activities because things are being squashed. And you tend to feel it down here. Most people think shoulder pain is felt here. It can be, but far, far more commonly, shoulder pain is felt down here. So if that's what you're feeling on doing this, that's what you've got. Now, what to do about that? Number one, how are you serving? What's your stance? And this is where your physiotherapist tends to come in. Because what we need to do is we need to take the pressure off that bursa. And what they can do is, first of all, improve your posture. Because when you stand with your shoulders back and your shoulder blade back, what you do is you open that space. And that's important. So they will look at your posture. The second thing they do is they will give you something called a TheraBand. And it's just a great big rubber elastic band. You tie one end around the door handle, close the door, and the other hand end you hold on your arm and you do these exercises with it against resistance. And what that does is it trains up these muscles that help to pull the ball down and they create a bigger gap. So your physiotherapist, there's all sorts of other maneuvers they can do, and they will do that. And in most people, if you manage to correct the problem that's solving it and your physiotherapist works on the muscle, that's fine. What will your doctor do? What will we do? What would I do? I would quite often inject the burst of the steroid. That steroid will calm everything right down. I personally would happily have physiotherapy without a steroid injection. I would not have the steroid injection without the physiotherapy. 
The steroid injection will calm it right down. You'll say, wow, you'll go for it, but you're not correcting the underlying problem. So you need both. If that continues to be a problem and the burst is angry, there is a keyhole operation that I can do to clean it out. I now do that pretty rarely because most of the time the injection in the physio works. Occasionally over time, if you end up with tendon tears and the tears don't happen through injury most of the time, through sudden ripping, they often happen over time gradually. That's something that can be repaired at the same time. So whether it's your leading shoulder in golf or whether it's your serving shoulder in tennis or any other shoulder, if you've got pain down here, particularly on doing reaching for overhead stuff, you can try it at home. It's probably bursitis. A physio and an injection will usually solve the problem. If it doesn't, I can do surgery. Most people don't need it. So that's the main shoulder problem. Let's then move on to the elbow. This bit will not surprise you so much. There is golfer's elbow and there is tennis elbow. And funnily enough, we'll talk about both. Let's start with tennis elbow. Tennis elbow is on the outside, golf is on the inside, and it's the same sort of thing. This, you'll be glad to know, is not a previous patient. This is a plastic model of an elbow. Uh, that is the inside of the elbow, and that is the outside of the elbow. And you can see that there is one bone here, the humerus in the upper arm, and there are two bones here, the radius and the, the radius and the ulna in the lower arm. The reason you have two bones here, by the way, and one bone there, is that that movement there happens between the radius and the ulna, which you can hopefully see when I rotate this skeleton. That's how that happens. But anyway, we look at the elbow here. Tennis elbow is pain on the outside here. Where is that noble in yourself? You can feel it in yourself. If you have a look at your own elbow and you feel just about there, if you find the tip and aim towards the other corner of the elbow, about a third of the way up, more on this side than on this side, you'll feel a noble. Tennis elbow gives you pain there. I personally have tennis elbow right now because I also drum in a band and um, I've been naughty and I haven't practiced enough and I've given myself tennis elbow. So I can show you all the things I'm doing to treat my own tennis elbow. Why do we get tennis elbow? Allow me, if you would, to tell you through the glories of the anatomy of how the hand and wrist works. It only takes a minute, but it's phenomenal. Let's think about the wrist going down and going up. For those of you who are anatomist, vola and dorsiflexion. There are a bunch of muscles here, it won't surprise you to know, and these muscles turn into tendons, these pieces of string that plug into the bone that bring the arm down that away. Likewise, on the other side, there's a bunch of muscles here, turns into tendons that bring this that away. The third and final piece of audience participation, if you could bring your wrist down like this and make a fist, you'll see what a weak, useless grip that is. Now bring your wrist up to here and make a fist and you'll see how strong that is. In fact, if you have it neutral like I do there and make a fist, you will actually see it'll probably come up a bit on its own. So making a fist, a strong fist, a good strong grip, be it for daily activity, a golf club or a tennis racket, depends on these muscles bringing the finger in and these muscles bringing the wrist back. So when you grip, these work. These are anchored via a tendon to the lateral epicondyle, which is that bit of bone just there, and repeated overuse there causes a bit of degeneration in that tendon. And that is what causes tennis elbow. So if you have pain when you press here, and actually particularly it's the middle finger extensor muscle, it's a good test. If you can push up against your own middle finger and it's hurting here, that's tennis elbow. Golfer's elbow is the opposite. Golfer's elbow is on the inside, that bony noble on the inside. It's a bit more prominent, as you can see here. That's the tennis on the outside. That huge blob is the golfer's on the inside. And if you press there and it hurts, and if you bring your arm down that way and push against something and it hurts here, you got yourself a golfer's elbow what to do about it. Now, this won't surprise you because as orthopedic surgeons, we have the same things, same treatments for most conditions. Number one is that steroid injection. And number two is physiotherapy. What does physiotherapy do? Well, they can do stretching exercises, that helps. They also 
um, can do something called eccentric exercises. Now, this isn't wearing a bow tie when you go to the gym, but I'm, shh, sorry, <laughs> but what it is, um, if you're in a gym and you have a dumbbell here and you work, make your biceps work, that's a concentric contraction of your biceps. If on the other hand, I bring your arm up here, I put that dumbbell in there, five kilograms, and gradually you let it out. That biceps is still working and stretching out. It's not falling down, it's still got some pull to it, but it's stretching out. That's eccentric exercises. And we know that heals sick tendons. I'm yet to find a good reason why. Maybe one of you knows, you can email me and tell me, but we know it does that. So what your physio will do, will be to give you a small weight. You, 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 some people say a can of beans. You, you, you bring your own hand up like that, you grab it in there and then you let it gradually come down. You do that a number of times, a few times a day, and that helps. Let's talk a little about the steroid injection. The steroid injection is really good at getting rid of the pain if you've got really bad pain. There is, if you were to look it up online, and I'm a big, People come and apologizing for Googling stuff. I think it's great. I think the more information you've looked up before you see me, fine, because then we can talk about it. That's right, that's wrong, we don't know, whatever, but I'm a fan of it. So if you look up steroid injections for, for, for tennis and golfer's elbow, and it's the same treatments for both, then they will say it only helps for a short period of time and actually don't really bother. My only issue with that is a lot of the studies have been done if not by me, by people like me, consultants in hospitals. But I know lots of GPs inject people. And I think those people never come to see me. So I think it probably is quite helpful. Personally, I'd have one done. The other thing we know about these problems is in most people, they are self-limiting. If you do nothing, they tend to go on their own in 18 months or so. But you guys are potentially here because you're playing sport. So you need to look at the whole body and how you're holding your rackets and clubs and see if that's contributing. There is a latest thing, not so much the latest thing, it's quite well established now, uh, called platelet-rich plasma. And this is something I do do um, because the scientific evidence behind it does show it seems to work really well here. It's a bizarre old thing. We get a patient, I will take about 30 mils of their blood, a big syringe full. We put it in a centrifuge and spin it down into its layers. And then I suck off the layer with the platelets Blood's got three components, the red cells that carry the oxygen, the white cells that fight infection, and the platelets that make your blood clots. Why the platelets? Well, we know they have loads of growth factors in them that help healing, and we inject it there. It doesn't work nearly as quickly as steroid, but the evidence suggests that it will actually work for much, much longer. And I have a number of people who came to me for, for the operation where I cut the tendon away, cut the bad bits away and sew it back onto the bone. I've had a number of people who've had steroid injections came for the operation. I did platelet rich plasma and they got better. Is it because the PRP worked? Is it because it's self-limiting and they've done their 18 months? I don't know, but what I can tell you is they didn't need surgery. Golfer's elbow is exactly the same thing on the inside, steroid injection, physio, stretching exercises, eccentric exercises, and most, pe most people hopefully better. So we've done rotator cuff problems and tendonitis and bursitis here. We've done tendonitis and tennis and golfer's elbow. Let's move on to the very final part of the talk where you can all be released <laughs> back into the heat again, which is the wrist. Um, the wrist is, again, another fascinating, fascinating organ. And you can see just how complex it is. You've got the two main bones, the radius and the ulna, and you've got these eight small carpal bones leading to these five metacarpals. The carpal bones are in here. The five metacarpals are here. And then you've got three bones in each of your fingers, one, two, three, you can see that by your knuckles, and two bones in the thumb. So the hand is, it's so intricate, it's so perfectly balanced, and it's so open to overuse and problems. You can get a problem anywhere in the wrist, but in both golf and tennis, it's this side of the wrist. The radius is there under the thumb. The ulna is there under the little finger. It's the ulna side of the wrist where that blob is, just to get that technical, that blob is the ulna head. This part just here of the ulna you can feel, that's where problems occur. And there are a couple of things that are, that are quite common. Particularly, there's a tendon that runs over the top and plugs into the bone here. What that tendon does 
is it brings the risk back, actually it brings it back and, and, and in that direction. But it runs in a groove. I'm gonna see if I can show this to you, wish me luck. Uh, I don't know if this projects at all, apologies if it doesn't, take my word for it. There's a groove in that bone there that it runs in and it can sometimes flip in and out of that groove. Even if it doesn't flip in and out of that groove, it can become really angry and inflamed. You're gonna see a lot of themes here, just like you have the synovial lining, lining your joint and lubricating it and lining your bursa. A bursa here, by the way, student's knee, bursa from the knee, housemaid's knee, um, student elbow, housemaid's knee. You have a bursa lining the tendon here, helping it glide, particularly because it runs under a pulley and that can get inflamed and angry. So it can be inflamed, it can be angry, and then it can flip in and out of the groove. And those are very common reasons. Particularly, I found when I was playing tennis, I would over-rotate and rotating really, really caused problems. And that's where my tennis coach said to me, stop doing that, I can see what you're doing. And I stopped and the whole thing settled down. Yes, you get pain here. A good test to see if it's angry is something called the synergy test, bizarrely where you push your thumbs together. And if you do that yourself, audience participation number four, you can feel the, the stress on the outside of there. So that just tells you if it's unhappy. And then the test to see if it's flipping in and out is either the so-called ice cream scoop test. If you pretend you're, you're scooping ice cream, if you can feel and see a tendon flicking out there, then you've got that. Or alternatively, the thing called the cobra test where you make your hand like the cobra and you rotate it around. And as you do that, you'll feel the strain there. If you want to see some examples of this online, look up ECU, that's the tendon, extensor carpi ulnaris, ECU problems, ECU instability. And you'll see online videos of patients doing this with things flicking. There's quite a few structures around there that can cause problems, but that's one of the commonest. So essentially, that's basically the talk done. What we've said is your doctor needs to look at the whole patient. And if you've got continuing problems, your pro needs to look at the whole of you to see what you're doing wrong. You can get bursitis here, tennis elbow here, golfer's elbow here, and ulnar-sided wrist pain, tendon irritation here as the most common problems. Um, I hope that's thrown some light on things and I'm here for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Flesh. That was really, really interesting. When you're talking about posture, I was like, oh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had a question um, that's come through um, yeah. saying how many steroid injections can one person have? That's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to give you a straight answer and the real answer. The real answer is we don't know. <laughs> the straight answer is you're going to hear the number three. Um, what does this um, come up to? Well, basically, uh, this is there because um, we know that steroids can weaken tendon. And um, uh, if you have too many steroid injections, you can actually theoretically get, get a tendon tear. So as a profession, we're settled on the number three. My personal feeling is if I, well, I don't do foot and ankle anymore unless I'm on call for acute trauma, but if I give a steroid injection into, um, uh, into the Achilles tendon, it'll rupture and that's not great. Um, if I give it to a professional violinist, I can give quite a few. So for me, if somebody has an injection that works, I would quite happily give them more than three as long as it's over a long period of time. But by the time we're getting to number three, that's the point at which I'm saying to people, maybe we should think about surgery. Right, brilliant. And um, we had a couple more questions. Is size of grip a factor? Um, I'm presuming you're, you're, you're talking about a tennis racket. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, but you can be talking about a golf club as well in theory. In tennis racket, um, I think it is. Um, for me, uh, I think if you ask 10 people, you'll get 10 answers. My personal feeling about this is that the grip has got to be right for your hand. That's the bottom line. And, you know, there are hand sizes and ten ra tennis racket sizes. So it's just got to be appropriate for your, for your hand, essentially. Um, and that's where I think going to the pro and making sure that they think your, your grip is correct. That's the way forward. Um, if you're 
if you're gripping too hard, you'll know it because you feel it in the forearms and that tennis elbow will probably come on. I hope that's answered that, that question. Thank you. And next question is, what about acid hyaluronic injections and yes. about PLP injection? Um, yeah. How often would you prescribe them? So the PRP, and we'll, we'll, we'll do both of these, the PRP, they say you can have up to three. Now, that, I, I, I find this really, uh, I, I like challenges and I find this quite challenging because when someone's had one PRP, right. do I really give number two and number three? Um, and uh, I don't really want to do something to someone if they don't need it. So my answer for that is I'm prepared to. In my personal experience, it's quite rare that I found I need to give number two or number three, but I, I will if, I, if, if someone needs it, basically. It's certainly worth a try before considering an operation. Um, hyaluronic acid is a fascinating thing. It's basically, I almost think of it like a lubricant, but it's got anti-inflammatory properties. And when you inject it into joints, it really settles them down. If you look at the nice guidelines on hyaluronic acid, um, they're apologies because I'll, I'll have to look this up but from memory there's a controversy and they say that actually perhaps we shouldn't be giving it and certainly in some hospitals I, I work at it's not because it's of the danger aspect of it but because they say overall they don't think it works I actually for example once had a 42 year old lady who came to see me with shoulder arthritis and I injected her with hyaluronic acid and it was just magnificent now, um, and, and I would happily do that again to her if she needed it. So uh, now there are some who argue it's placebo, some who say it's anti-inflammatory. All I can tell you is that it worked and it didn't have any of the negative aspects of steroid for it. So the studies say in my mind, okay, apologies, personal bugbear time, but the studies say, here's what a, a, a works for a population. And I take nice guidelines very seriously i think they should be listened to i think there are a bunch of very intelligent people who come up with them but if for an individual something is licensed and i think it might help them i might use it in that person it's certainly an option worth exploring so i'm not anti-ha is what i'd say brilliant thank you and um, next question what can we do after recovering from tennis elbow um, and still feel a bit of pain when grabbing something um, yes, so um, if you're recovering for, ah, okay, so the first thing is going to be, I didn't talk about the splints, did I? I knew there's something I missed there. So um, <laughs> a tennis elbow splint doesn't work in everybody. Um, but the whole thing about it, you can buy them on Amazon, they're about five quid, and it's literally a C-shaped thing with a big blob here and one there, and it, uh, you can tell I'm getting technical, and it, and it grips, and it's the same for a golfer's elbow, and by gripping here, the whole idea is that when you make a fist, those forces are absorbed here, and they don't quite make it to the elbow. They don't work in everyone. So the way to test if they're gonna work in you is to get someone, feel that tennis elbow there and get someone to grip just beyond it. Get them to do that. Not so that it hurts, but just enough to take the pressure off. And then what you wanna do at that point is force your, either your middle finger or the whole wrist up. If forcing the middle finger or the wrist up hurts here without them doing that, then you've got tennis elbow. If you then get them to do that and that's less painful, a splint will really help and work for you. So that's something worth trying if you haven't tried it. It doesn't work on everyone, but it works for some. Certainly if that doesn't work, absolutely go and see a physiotherapy. There are some other modalities that are worth exploring as well. Um, shockwave is an interesting one. Um, it's quite painful, but you can get shockwave. It's 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 jig, 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 jig for off the end of this thing. And actually, um, <laughs> again, I'm getting technical. Um, ap apologies for the anecdotal medicine here, but um, I work in, in Yorkshire. I, I have clinics in a place called Bridlington, gorgeous place by the sea. And um, there's a physio there who does shockwaves, for example, on Achilles tendons. And he scans them before and after with an ultrasound and he's seen things looking better. So ultrasound treatment, shockwave treatment, these are all things worth exploring. Brilliant. Someone else has said, um, I have tennis elbow, is it advisable to have injection? Um, so I'm guessing that's what you just spoke about. about. Um, what I would say is that if you follow, <laughs> if you follow the NICE guidelines that say don't bother having a, a steroid injection, um, I'm healing my own. But if it doesn't get better, 
I'm going to get some <laughs> steroid on me. I mean, look, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but that is the mainstay of, st of treatment. And all of the textbooks up until now have that in there, and that's what I'll do on me. So that's what I do personally. Oh, Mr. Orpish, Simmons put, thank you very much for a very informative talk and demo. It was great and much better than PowerPoints. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> I'm really grateful. <laughs> That's lovely to say, especially because I was um, messaging Mr. Orpish for his um, slides, <laughs> like literally <laughs> up until today. And he was like, I'm not doing slides. And I was like, okay. So I think it did work better. Um, right. We've got some more questions. Right. Will strengthening your forearm muscles prevent golfers and tennis elbow? Um, uh, great question. Yes, to a degree. I think controlled strengthening is, is, is something worth doing. Um, but for me, um, when I think about my own tennis elbow, I brought it on despite having reasonable strength. For me, it was the technique of what I did that wasn't right. And actually, and this is where sports and music um, coincide. I didn't practice enough. and I went all in. So for me, that was that was the deal. And I think, you know, from personal experience, when I got my ulnar sided wrist pain, it was the same there. So, yes, I think it's a really good thing to do. But sometimes using those muscles hard as anything is what's kind of making it worse in some ways. So it has to be in a controlled fashion. But is it worth strengthening them? Yes, it is worth strengthening them. I, I, absolutely. I'll always advocate. And I wish I'd strengthened mine some more. <laughs> you think I <I'm> <laughs> We've got another question. What about truck drivers, um, dr truck driver shoulder pain? Um, mm. Would you recommend PLP injections? So, sorry, what shoulder pain? Truck. And um, truck drivers um, oh, shoulder sorry. pain. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Now that's um, interesting because um, when you say would you recommend PRP, the question is what is PRP good for? Um, it has been used in everything, <laughs> essentially because it's it's from yourself. Um, and so you're just injecting a bit of you back into you. Suddenly the, the studies in the orthopedic journals came out for everything. So we know it, it, it's great for tendinopathies, for sick tendons. People have tried it around the rotator cuff and it's been a much, much more mixed picture. So you find your advocates and you find people who don't believe in it. And there are plenty of both. Um, my feeling is that if you're truck driving, the question, first of all, is, is what is it that's bringing it on? Um, is, is it a power steering issue? And I, at this point, I must confess, I don't know so much about truck driving. So um, that's where I'd get you to describe where your pain is. Um, I'm gonna, do I have two minutes to do a, a five second guide to problem, problem pain around the shoulder? Go on then, I'll let you go. <laughs> the, the collarbone here meets part of the shoulder blade coming forward. Um, I once did a talk where I took my top off. None of you need that. But anyway, so pain here, just there, is the AC joint. It's a tiny joint. It's not the main ball and socket. That's just down there. That's the AC joint there. And that's a very separate pain. So if that's where your pain is, that, that's different. Pain from the rotator cuff classically, not always, because the shoulder doesn't always read the textbook. Pain on coming up to the one side that brings pain down there is, is cuff and bursitis pain. And usually it's overhead activities, which I appreciate may not be a truck driving phenomenon, but that could still do it. If you turn your palm up and then come up, and that's easier, that creates more space turning that palm up. So thumb down coming up, pain down here, and then palm up coming up, pain disappears. That's a bursitis rotator cuff problem. Classically a frozen shoulder, which is usually people with diabetes or we don't quite know why, but more commonly women 40 to 60. That's pain moving your shoulder in any direction, but particularly doing this. Um, arthritis is also mainly pain on doing this particularly as well. That's really stiff. So those are the commonest problems around the shoulder outside of instability and instability, you know, because a dislocation's a dislocation. There ain't no arguing with that, so you know what that is. So I don't know if that helps you bring some of your, your shoulder pain to, 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 to more of a, a localized area. I hope that helps because yeah, the truck driving alone, it could be any of those things to be honest with you actually. Thank you, Mr. Orflesh. Um, has anyone got any more questions? I'll just check the Q&A box. 
Next, I think that's it. Thank you so much as all flesh. You've been brilliant. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight, this evening. Um, like I, I said earlier, we have I have put a link in the chat box if you would like to leave feedback. Um, but thank you for attending today and we hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone. Goodbye.